Blake Hardesy, Choke Points, Bones of the Fourth Estate, Chapter, Merritt and Hawk, 2118. I first went up in O2 for a piece I was given by M. Datchell, who was a travel editor for the journal at the time, such as that publication still was back then. It was a cushy gig, the kind of job you only get after doing a thousand much worse jobs in just such a way and it was the kind of thing M would give you as a pat on the back for being such a good steward of the game. Everything about the trip was five stars. You exit the limo with a brimming sense of anticipation, seeing this unimaginable, towering edifice impossibly extending into the sky beyond reach of your very eyes, and you think, no way, this isn't really happening. I'm going up there, today. They catch you with that. It's palpable, that excitement. And that's what I'm supposed to write about, talk about, share with others. Easy enough. I was sold. The surroundings in the skyport were like a high-end casino with that industry's tacky scum all washed out on the Orlando resorts and the beaches to the east. This place was clean, glistening with gold. Literal gold pulled out of the asteroids and plated to the pillars that hold up the holding area. Pieces like this write themselves. You hardly even have to lie. Then I see this girl scanning luggage for the bellboys. Young, tall, but not too tall. Impossibly pretty. Perfect teeth. Perfect posture. Rosy demeanor. Just bouncing the palpable excitement in the air back onto the guests. And I couldn't help but think, how the hell can a girl that young be so impeccably good at her game? She had a way about her that you might see from a server at a diamond restaurant after two decades in the business. Long after the honeymoon and the old hat, through the phase when she's learning how to make it seem like she's still enjoying herself, despite the fact it's been a decade since it was either fun or drudgery, this girl knew. She knew what to call everyone, knew that she didn't have a hair out of place, knew how the machinery worked. Hell, she probably knew exactly what was in my luggage, and I wondered where the hell did she wake up this morning? What does her apartment look like? I spent the ride up looking out the window, like everyone else, but instead of gawking in wonder and making stupid comments about the horizon slowly rounding into a gleaming blue marble, I was thinking about the baggage girl. She'd gotten me thinking about a girl I'd met on vacation back when I was in college. My family had rented a villa in the Caribbean, my mom, dad, brother, and his girlfriend, and I had flown down solo. I was at Dartmouth then, probably sophomore year. On my first night on the island, I noticed this girl serving drinks in the pool area of the hotel where we'd gone to dinner. She was my age, skinny and sweet. And then, just beneath the surface, there was something I didn't understand at the time. She wasn't from Wellesley, and maybe it was just that. Something a little rebellious, I thought. The second night I was down there, we slept together. In the morning after, she asked me if I wanted to come swimming with her and her friend who was a cook in the hotel kitchen. And I never really thought about it being significant, but I'd never really done anything like that before. Certainly never met one of the cooks who'd made me a meal at a restaurant. There was something invigorating about unearthing the real people behind the roles these surface-level people played in my life. Perhaps that's what I thought I might get to do if I went into journalism. Maybe that was part of it. The girl's name was Sadie, and her friend the cook was Matt. It was pretty clear he was interested in her, but he would only ever be a friend. We ended up driving along this ridiculously winding road around the island. It occurred to me at one point that if they'd left me out there, I'd have had no idea how to get back. I barely knew this Sadie, but I figured that if she'd wanted to rob me, she could have cleaned me out back at the villa the night before. She didn't seem serious enough to even think that way, and Matt was harmless. We stopped at this little inlet, a very small bay with a tiny dirt parking lot, and across the bay, There was a beautifully empty white sand beach that stretched all the way to the end of the bay. Above the beach, there were four or five towering villas that put the place my family had rented to shame. Big money houses. Matt and Sadie stripped to swimwear and started swimming, and I followed along. When we finally beached ourselves on the other side of the bay, we walked the length of the shore, sat in the shade, and lay out in the sand, sunning ourselves for brief periods. At one point, Matt said to me, Don't worry about anything, Blake. I know the law. It's a maritime thing. As long as you don't have a boat, they can't deny you the shore. 
It was peculiar. I didn't know what the hell he meant by it, so I smiled and nodded. A few minutes later, a lady appeared on the beach with a pair of West Indian guys in polo shirts asking us if there was anything she could help us with. We all knew what that meant, and Matt told her what he'd told me earlier, that we had every right to be on that beach. Yes, she acknowledged, but the peninsula was private land, gated, and we were past the gate. Matt told her that we'd stay on the beach as long as we pleased and walk back to the road, a public accommodation. We had a right away from the shore to the public space on the island. He and Sadie seemed to enjoy being in the right, about the only thing they'd ever be able to get over on this multi-millionaire on her private peninsula. So we did just that. We walked back to the road, just to walk back to the car we'd swum from in the first place. The two polo-shirted guys saw us out at the gate. I bet it bothered that lady to no end seeing these kitchen people on her private beach. Probably got her thinking about how much better it would be to have private island money rather than the private peninsula money she currently held. Sadie never would have made it as a luggage scanner in the space ladder's baggage area. Her teeth weren't perfect. She was a little too short, and her posture was only average at best. When we finally arrived at Apogee, I discovered the perfect baggage girl from the foyer was average. There were guides helping people to the shuttles, coaching new guests on zero-g, the snorkel guides of the 22nd century. The boys were immaculate, square-jawed creatures with fine eyes and well-practiced humor, laughing convincingly at the same dull jokes they'd heard a thousand times before. The girls ushering guests from causeway to floating causeway were just as sweet as the first one I'd seen down below. I didn't once mistake a guest for staff while I was up there. You knew instantly who was who. I couldn't get that pretty baggage girl's apartment out of my mind. I thought back all those years ago to that dull little hovel of an apartment Sadie rented on the basement level of a Caribbean island house, lizards poking in through holes in her filthy screens, a toilet that barely flushed, water that couldn't be drunk. She'd taken me there later that week, and it was the last I ever saw of her. How much did these perfect plastic kids need to dress up to be window dressing in this space world? How much contortion did they force out of themselves to get them past these newer, taller choke points? The whole time I was up there, I couldn't stop staring at their pretty blue polo shirts. And then it hit me, as I was churning out glowing copy for the Sunday Journal feature, that I was wearing a complimentary white apogee polo myself. Right pretty, Blake, dearie and we'll let you see our castle above the clouds. My apartment, at the time, was an utter shithole. I made space read like a fairy tale dreamland. Choke Points This has been an original sci-fi short written and read by P.E. Rowe. I hope you enjoyed it. Today's short was an excerpt from my upcoming novel, The Lifeboat. If you liked what you heard, there are already quite a few stories on the channel set in the Lifeboat story world, and if you're interested, you can check out that playlist, which will be linked in the card popping up now or at the end of the video. If you're new to the channel and enjoy sci-fi, I upload a new original audiobook story every Thursday morning, so there's an ever-expanding collection of sci-fi stories on the channel for you to explore. If you enjoy them, I'd love it if you subscribed and joined us each week when new stories premiere. For the intrepid listeners out there who've been tuning in for our Misfits series, I'll be back next week, June 8th, with the sixth installment in the series based on the topic Space Towers. I can't wait to share that with you all then. Thanks for tuning in for this mini-episode. We've got one more coming up on Sunday with a surprise narrator, so look for that as well. I hope to catch you back here soon for another new story. This has been P.E. Rowe, and I hope to see you next time.